Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at iron and steel, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and the role of scientists during the First World War. We hear now from Rob Newman about forestry and the demand for timber. My name is Robert Newman. I'm a PhD student at the University of Kent. My area of interest is forestry during the First World War. Before the First World War, the state of forests in the UK was very poor. In April 1914, in a debate in the House of Commons, it was mentioned that if anybody was to walk through areas such as the Forest of Dean or the New Forest, they would see how scanty the trees were. In 1914, between 4 and 6% of the country is covered in woodlands. The average in Europe was something like 25%. A few of the foresters who were well known were French or German. France and Germany had a good history of looking after their forests. Certainly France, after they'd been quite badly destroyed in the terror after the revolution, Napoleon realised that they were important resources and therefore put quite a lot of controls on them. There was William Schlick a German forester who in 1904 wrote a treatise on why and how timber management could be improved in the UK. A lot of the forestry was owned by gentlemen foresters, large landowners. They kept their forests hunting deer, hunting game birds, and they would rent out hunting rights. The Office of Woods looked after crown forests, but those had been largely neglected at the outbreak of the First World War. Britain was very heavily reliant on timber imports. We imported somewhere in the region of 90% of our timber in 1913. The basis of so much that was done during the war was timber. From the outset, the Office of Works needed massive amounts of timber to build hutting. Men joining the armed forces, they need somewhere to be housed. It's also essential for mines. We were importing an awful lot of our pit props and our mining timber. If we think about the Western Front, large parts of the front needed wood revetments to keep the trenches standing and to keep them deep. This was something found out by troops in the winter of 1914 and into 15, where the trenches would collapse in the bad weather. You needed duck boards. One of the most iconic things in the First World War is the men tramping along duck boards to try and keep their feet dry. Mining under the front to plant mines under the enemy's defences, they would require massive amounts of slab and pit timber. Roads near or just behind the front line, Passchendaele. If you see pictures of people walking across where we've advanced, where the artillery's broken up the land, they're walking on slab roads, half trunks, round roads, or duck paths, again, footpaths. Railways, without the sleepers, we wouldn't have been able to build the light railways up to the front. Charcoal fuel, wood burning fuel, The rifle stocks, the stakes, the barbed wire in front of the British trenches was put on wooden stakes. So wood was considered by many of the high-level officers at the time as one of the most essential wartime materials there was. And therefore, certain measures had to be put in place by government and organisations who were concerned. You see a centralisation. This is something that's largely associated with the Lloyd George coalition government that comes in in December 1916, but there are elements of it happening before then, under Asquith. Pre-war bodies such as the Office of Woods, the Boards of Agriculture, and there's different Boards of Agriculture around the UK, and the Board of Trade, the mining industry, all concerned with timber usage. They very quickly come together to try and stop the duplication of work. One of the first things that gets done in August 1914, is a mission is sent to Canada and Newfoundland to try and establish new sources of pit wood and other forms of timber. And that is really the first example of what continues and grows throughout the course of the war in terms of this centralisation of control. You have various bodies at the start. You then have the War Office for a time take over, their Directorate of Timber Supplies, but that's only four months or so. Then it goes back to the Board of Trade, who set up a timber supply department, increasing home production, 
and also ensuring imports are maintained as much as possible. This was recognised as an issue as the German U-boat threat increases. At the end of 1916, the levels of sinkings are going up and up, and it's in the start of February 1917 that the Germans announce unrestricted submarine warfare again. So the War Office and the Board of Trade who take over management, they've looked around and they said, well, we should have enough timber in the UK, but we need the labour. A women's forestry service would be established. But before that, towards the beginning of 1916, they looked to the empire. And where did the British Empire have a lot of lumberjacks? Canada. So they sent an urgent telegram to the Canadian government asking them to raise lumberjack units and send them over to Europe so they can work in the forest of the UK, producing timber much closer to the front. The Canadians respond with great gusto and vigour and start raising battalions, which will eventually become the Canadian Forestry Corps. They're equipped by Canada, they're shipped over, and they're put to work in British forests initially. But very importantly, they'll go over to France. France had much better forests than Britain did. Eventually, the vast majority of Canadian companies will be cutting good timber nearer to the front lines. And as well as the Canadian Forestry Corps, Newfoundland sent a forestry company over to work in the forest of Britain. There were even units sent from New England as America joined the war in April 1917. One of the first American forces to arrive in Britain were the New England sawmill units that had been raised by the public in New England. So the labour we got from where we could. You could join the lumber units if you had missing fingers because it was considered part of being a lumberjack. Lieutenant Colonel Penn Hallwood was commanding the Canadian Forestry Corps unit working in Great Windsor Park, which had been lent for the war effort, as quite a bit of land was lent by King George V and Queen Mary. They were there working their way through good plantations, some of them oak plantations that had been planted as far back as Elizabeth I. Lieutenant Colonel Penhorwood became quite good friends with the King and Queen, who showed real interest in the forestry work, and also the farming and the livestock keeping that the Canadian forestry men were carrying out to try and be self-sufficient. In archives in Canada, I've seen invitations to Lieutenant Colonel Penhorwood to dine with the King and Queen at Windsor Castle. A young lad at the time, Joe Leggett, who later in his life wrote his memoirs of being a schoolboy in Hampshire and of the Canadians taking down the forests for the war effort. He and his brother used to enjoy seeing the speed with which they would build their own camps, the speed at which they would cut down the timber, and would even at times get lifts home from school on the back of their horse-drawn wagons full of timber that had been cut. It's a lovely memoir produced by the Lip Hook and Bramshute Historical Society. The converse of that is Lewis Grassic Gibbon, the Scottish novelist, who wrote The Scots Choir, the trilogy. In the first part, Sunset Song, one of his characters, a farmer up in the northeast of Scotland near Aberdeen, comes home from serving overseas and looks out of his window on the first morning he's back on leave to discover that the trees that had been surrounding his farm and protecting his farm and his crops from the high winds have all been removed. He spends the rest of his leave wandering the village and complaining that his wife has allowed this to happen, saying that he will never be able to use the land for crops again. That is one of the negative aspects of the timber effort during the First World War. As military service acts start coming in, quite a few of the professions within the timber trade are protected. There is evidence that some mining companies were writing to the war office asking that their lumbermen be released from active service back to them. The Timber Trade Federation, which existed before the war, put a lot of work in dealing with government bodies, deciding which trades within the overall profession should be protected. As early as 1916, when the Reconstruction Committee is established to look at society after the war, a forestry subcommittee is established under Ackland, and it becomes known as the Ackland Committee. So while you've got this amazing effort going on, to supply the home front and the battlefront with the timber that is required. You also have expert panels running in parallel, thinking about what the state of British forestry will be after the war and how it can be improved. They do recommend some planting schemes, but very few of these are taking up during the war itself. The main legacy is that they recommend the formation of the Forestry Commission, 
very soon after the war in 1919, David Lloyd George says we can never be that reliant on imported timber again. And therefore, the Forestry Commission is established to start building up our supplies of timber producing woodlands in the UK. And a good way of doing this is, as seen during the war, to centralise management of this area. You still have the timber trades, but you have a body who is working to improve the nation's forests. That was Rob Newman on forestry and the demand for timber during the First World War. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Dr Rob Robinson about the fishing industry in the First World War.